This podcast is a part of the Podmania Podcasting Network. Check out podmania.co.uk to check out more of our great podcasts, features, reviews, match ratings and previews spanning the crazy and diverse world of professional wrestling. You're listening to the Podmania Pro Wrestling Podcast, a sample of the best pro wrestling podcasts we can produce on our tiny budget. Check us out on Apple Podcasts, Podcast Addict, CastBox, and all other podcast platforms. If it's wrestling you want, check out more of our great content at podmania.co.uk. Let's do this. Hello, hello, and welcome to another episode of the Pod Mania Podcast. I'm your host, Rob Gooden. I'm joined as ever by Chris O'Brien and the man who has taken just a little bit of time out of his day of baiting New Japan marks on Twitter. It's Garth Jackson. <laughs> How are we, lads? To be honest, I'm just glad he stopped doing it in our chat. <laughs> <laughs> good. Good, good, good. Fantastic. Uh, I... I've watched a lot of ECW in the last week, and also I've still not recovered from fucking Dominion. It it, it was a slog, was Dominion, uh, in more ways I, than one. Uh, however, I did um, attend an online um, music conference, because it's normally held in Edinburgh, but instead I got free pass through it online. I watched a lecture on how TikTok is going to change the music industry, literally. Oh, God, I hope not. <laughs> that sounds like the most depressing lecture I think I could ever have... <laughs> I couldn't invent yeah, anything more depressing than that. The the um tone of the lecture was basically last time we ignored something this big in the music industry, H and B collapsed and we went into record low profit, so we need to not ignore this at the very least. Oh God. Um so apart from depressing the masses, Chris, with your uh, with the lecture on TikTok, what else have you been up to? Um playing Breath of the Wild, which is fun um i got into an argument with my niece the other day over who's the most basic and did we establish who was the most basic um my mother told me to stop arguing with a 10 year old <laughs> <laughs> yeah I, I think that does basically make you the de facto basic person in that argument yeah <laughs> <laughs> um garth how many consoles do you own breath of the wild on uh, just one <laughs> just the one, just the one. Okay. Yeah. I mean, With he doesn't, own, he doesn't own a Switch. Superior so. Say that again. On the Wii U. I'm, I'm one of the three people who owns a Wii U. <laughs> I own a Wii U. Yeah, and I was just going to say, Chris is one of the other ones. Um, I've been meaning to get around to hacking it, because I, I, you know, like, no one wants to buy a Wii U, because at that point, you just buy a door stop and plug it into your tally. But... I don't know, I might hack it, see if we can get GameCube games on it, because that's really all I care about at my advanced age. I've got uh, GameCube games on mine. <laughs> I remember <laughs> the first wrestling game I played, obviously apart from WrestleMania 2000 on the Game Boy Color, um, <laughs> which was amazing. It only had like nine wrestlers on it, but it was fucking class. Uh, one of the wrestlers was Vince McMahon, so gives you an idea of the quality of the thing, um, was, was on the GameCube, and it was a person I very rarely hung out with like i don't really know why i was in their house but they they knocked on for me and therefore i went to their house and to this day i cannot remember what it was called but it was on the gamecube was it wrestlemania 17 or day, was it 18? Or day of reckoning ah, day of reckoning sort of sounds familiar it might have been day of reckoning um yeah, that was that's a fun favorite by us um, I just, I just remember it being like, oh my god, not everything's flat like on the Game Boy, <laughs> and not everyone's finishing move as a suplex. Um, <laughs> that was it. It was, it was a revelation for me. Um, when I was a kid, um, we couldn't like for the longest time we couldn't afford a PlayStation. We had a Mega Drive, and so the first time I ever saw a PS One, and this was like two years after the PS Two came out. It- Blew my fucking mind. <laughs> like I saw Spider Man and I'm like, oh my god, you can swing? <laughs> and it's not really choppy. Oh my god, it's not stop start. 
Um, it's amazing the things you get like excited about. We didn't have a console in our house because of the amount of sport we played. It was, it was just a waste of money. And then eventually, um, <laughs> my mum was always like, no, I'm not going to have you having a console because I don't want you inside. I want you outside. Not because you didn't love us, but, you know, she didn't want <laughs> to, you know, she, yeah, <laughs> just, fuck off. Um, I remember me and my brother standing at my nan's house, standing with an Argos catalogue, doing a pitch to my mum about getting us a PS2. And I remember <laughs> distinctly, it was, it was, was we were standing there and my nan was in a chair pissing herself. And me and my brother were standing there really formal, like, good day, mother. Uh, <laughs> today, <Sit down>. yeah, <laughs> if you'd like to take a seat, would you like anything? Water, tea, coffee? No? Wonderful. Um, we'd like to discuss the possibility of a PlayStation 2 with you. Yes, I know what you're thinking, mother. <laughs> you're just going to go and play that Grand Theft Auto and then we had to go through <laughs> and talk about how we weren't going to play any violent games. And the only games we wanted was FIFA and Lord of the Rings. Um, and yeah, eventually we got it. Apparently, our pitch was that damn good. But uh, yeah, it uh-huh. always sticks in my head. That always sticks in my head. And I just remember the Lord of the Rings being like, holy shit, this is amazing. And you play on it now, it's like piece of shit. But like then, it was the best thing ever. Um, which, which Lord of the Rings are we talking about? Now, we, the two towers first. Oh, yeah. That was good. It was brilliant. Um, apart from when you got to the end and you got Legolas's arrows that just went through everything, and you were like, "Well, <laughs> pretty much completed the game now," because nothing could be him. Um, and then we got the Return of the King afterwards, and it just wasn't as good. Yeah. I remember that my like when I got to the age where I knew what I wanted, like sort of console wise, and it was like Christmas. So it was ninety two, so I would have been twelve. I guess I'm that old, and it was. <laughs> <laughs> Nintendo, and uh, it was the Street Fighter Super Nintendo, and I was desperate because I I, look, I spent so much money in the arcades, and I remember similar to you, like not a pitch, but like going to my mum and I'd cut out like everything I could find from the papers and the catalogs and stuff. I cut them out and made the sheet, and I presented it to my mum. <laughs> was this pre Argos? No, it's how it. Well, no, well. The Argus catalog was a significant uh, piece of literature back then. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> it was studied in schools. Like we didn't like, afford books back in your day. So. It was stuff like uh, from like uh, Games Master magazine and stuff, and I cut out like all the pictures of the Super Nintendo, and I just saw there was absolutely no margin for error that she got the right thing. Oh, we've all been there. <laughs> we've all been there. Um, I remember going to France with school. We will get onto the topic of our podcast in a moment, by the way. Um, but I remember going to... How fancy school did you go to? <laughs> well, I went to school and um, I was going to France on a residential trip. And I was reading the Artemis Fowl series at the time. Um, the book that has led to the award-winning film on Disney+. Plus. It's dog shit. Don't watch it. Um, so anyway... Um, my mum was like, right, I'm going to surprise Rob because he's going to France, first time away from home. Um, let's get his dad to go and try and find the brand new Artemis Fowl book. He can read it on the bus. Uh, my dad went from shop to shop to shop. Bless him. He was out for fucking ages. And eventually he rang my mum and just went, Net, I, I can't find this book. I have been to 17 shops. None of them have even heard the series Artemis Fowl. Not one, not one of them. Um, and she was like, Dave, what what are you asking for? And he went, well, I'm asking for the book he wanted for Rob. And she was like, and what did you say it was called? And without a shred of embarrassment, he just went, the Optimus Prime series. (laughs) (laughs) My my dad, right? So I I didn't really... It's only recently that this was what happened. My dad used to sneak into my room when I was sleeping to play on my PlayStation. (laughs) (laughs) Lad, absolute (laughs) lad. (laughs) Do you know how I found this out um, when I was younger? Because I got up one day. Because um, he's fuck I, off. I was, I was, <laughs> one game I ever played um, when I was a kid was my Spider-Man game. Play, um, pressed on and Tomb Raider was in it. And I was like, I don't own Tomb Raider. <laughs> <laughs> you do now. <laughs> your dad bought the Tomb Raider game for himself on your PlayStation. That- yes, because he, he found it in a charity shop for like two quid. And he's like, well, Chris can't play this. But I can't. <laughs> that's amazing that is absolutely that's amazing rough. that's totally what I'm going to do with my kids absolutely 100% I'll do that now <laughs> with your 18,000 games yeah Benjamin there's three for you and all the rest for me. 
<laughs> um, right, lads, before we move on, uh, what are our tipple of choices? And Garth, I swear to God, if yours is medicinal, I'll fucking hit you. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, when you say medicinal, I've got Dr. Oh. Pepper. <laughs> when you said that, I, I thought you were like lighting up split or something. <laughs> oh. No, it is honestly at the moment. I, I would kill for some of that shit. Um, <laughs> I've actually actively been looking for some of the gummies, but it's really hard to find. Um, but it's, it is kind of legal. I uh, yeah, true. Uh, but no, I've got Dr Pepper and uh, regular good old Yorkshire tea. Good stuff. Um, Chris, what about yourself? Um, Scottish breakfast tea. Scottish bre- How is that different from English breakfast tea? It's, it's probably not, but I'll be fucked from buying anything with the word English on it. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't either. Well, again, and I don't understand how the fuck this has happened. I am the only one drinking on this damn podcast. Um, I have a lovely bottle of Star Pramen, which is going down an absolute treat. Um, I've also got a bulldog cup full of Twinings. English breakfast tea <laughs> and uh, a can of... Forget it, Rob. You're a Tory. Don't shout it from the fucking shop. <laughs> and a can of Pepsi Max. So I'm set for all eventualities. <laughs> As I was about to say, you've got enough fucking beverages, man. Jesus Christ. <laughs> this, this is the reason I need to piss so badly after every single fucking podcast we do. Because of the <laughs> amount it. of liquids I take on board during recording. So, Gav, we finished Pure Main of the other day. And, like, we were doing our standard post spring chat. And he was like, oh, I've been busting for a piss since the cup. And I'm like, you're editing it. You can just say, can we stop? Uh, uh, true. So you thought that. if there are any dodgy cuts on this podcast, it's because Rob has needed to go tinkle. So I apologize for that. Anyway, uh, we should probably bring this screeching back to the topic at hand. So today we are doing a retro pay-per-view review. It is our first foray as a collective. Um into ECW, and we are looking at ECW Heatwave 1998, widely considered to be ECW's best pay-per-view that they put out in its history. Um, Chris, this was your choice, so just before we delve headlong into the actual show, do you want to say why you wanted to do this show? Because I want to see what Garth's like when he has to watch ECW. <laughs> I mean that's um, that's a reasonable, yeah, fair enough. Fair enough. I mean, also, it's just ECW's best pay per view. Like it's probably top to bottom the most watchable. Like there's nothing that like makes me think. Uh, like for example, I would have picked like barely legal ninety seven. But then there's that fucking Shane Douglas versus Pitbull match, and I would have picked like Living Dangerously two thousand. But there's some shit stuff in there. Like whereas here, like this is of like a perfect distillation of the best parts of um, 98, 97, ECW, so. Fair enough. Um, Garth, obviously you were you were about 35 um, around here. Um, I was one. <laughs> no, in all seriousness, like you were you were older than both me and Chris at this time. Um, do you Please. have do you have any memories of ECW? Did you watch any ECW? Kind of like at the time, so we're talking 98, um, I remember seeing bits of it. And I, me- I remember hearing people talk about it and think, oh, have you seen that ECW? It's it's like hardcore shit. And I remember uh, used to, one of my mates used to go to, we used to watch the wrestling and stuff. And his, his little brother used to watch, get the stuff from school. And he had a tape of the stuff. And I remember us just going, in his, like, I remember going in his room and looking, watching it. I was like, this is fucking insane. When you compare it to like WWE, it was quite, I mean, there was swearing, there were, like, all that sort of, like, it was, yeah, but it seemed quite trashy. It was like, it was like the wrestling equivalent of Jerry Springer. <laughs> um, but it was, cause, but because it was different, um, it was good because you had, at the time, you had WCW as well. But this was, 98, this was when I was at the height of me, well, not me height, I'd probably just got into me descent into madness when it comes to sort of alcohol <laughs> uh, and other substance. So I barely recollect a lot of this period. <laughs> was there even a 1998? I was, I was a, a student and B, 
I could get into put well I could, I could get into pubs before but I could get into most clubs and pubs so I was fucking just getting wasted all the time basically. <laughs> what you missed, what you missed, Rob, before um, you joined the call today was Garth giving me a mini lecture of why the nineties was the best. I mean, looking back, it probably wasn't, but uh, <laughs> it was but fun at the time. the time. It was fun at the time, mate. It was a <laughs> damn sight better than the eighties. Uh, I suppose unless you had money. Well, yeah, I suppose. <laughs> well, any decade's good if you've got money, isn't it? I mean, even the 1910s was good if you had money. No, if you're, not if you're in the French Revolution. Well, no, that well, the French Revolution was pretty much dead and buried in 1910. Well, the Russian Revolution. You said French. But I said, and then I, and also the Russian Revolution. Oh, well, I imagine if you're part of any revolution, it's not great. Well, what about an ECW hardcore revolution? Oh, I tell you what, that is that's a fucking transition and half. That is well done, Chris. You 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 get proper applause for that. So let's uh, let's go into this um, ECW Heatwave 1998 from the second of August 1998 from the Har Arena, Dayton, Ohio, at an attendance of four thousand three hundred and seventy six. Uh, the way we're going to do this, um, Chris decided he was going to go down an ECW black hole. So I'll introduce the matches and the results. Um, basically, a little anything that sort of led up to this match. Um, on the pay per view, anything that is done from ECW TV that led into this match, Chris will then dive in, give you a little bit of context, and then me and Garth will simply go off what is on the pay per view. So, uh, before we start, um, this is my first ever ECW show. Uh, this is the first bit of ECW I've ever seen outside of other shows. So outside of like wrestling with regrets retro reviews, I've never seen an ECW show um, all the way through or at all. So this was uh, this was fairly interesting for me. I must admit. So we started uh, with Joey Styles coming out, uh, running down the card, and then Shane Douglas, the ECW Heavyweight Champion, came down with Francine, who was wearing literally nothing. <laughs> um. <laughs> I, I, put, I, put, I put it in my notes. It's like, what Francine is wearing can't even be considered close. No, it would be it would be considered too much for softcore porn, um, what Francine was wearing. Basically, she was wearing a bikini and a sheer robe. That was uh, basically what she was wearing. Um, and then there was a wonderful moment where um, they commented on how nice Joey Styles looked, and Joey Styles went, yep, this suit is double-breasted, just like Francine. And... Yeah, um, my- been a running theme on ECW TV because Shane Douglas is injured right now, so to keep him on TV, um, be having on commentary, um, and <laughs> they keep going quiet, and it's like I'm I'm sure you were in quiet there. Joey Styles was looking under Francine's dress. <laughs> <laughs> it, it oh god, when you compare even like this opening, um, with the stuff that WWF was pointing out pointing out at this time. Even WCW was pointing out pointing out at this time, and WCW was a little bit edgier, especially early nineteen ninety eight than the WWF was. It's just it's a completely different world. Completely different. And they do actually make reference to that many, 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 many times throughout the show. Some, some would say too much. Well yeah. I will just say as well that we've watched the network version of this, or at least I have. Um um, I did too, yeah. Yeah, just yeah, because did, yeah. it's easier. So, yes, we completely 100% understand that there is an um, insane amount of dubbing going on, but, you know, it's just it's part and parcel uh, with what you get with this. So Also, very quickly, well, one thing I did want to point out is ECW suffering fairly heavy losses going into this show. Like, if you just look at the um, pay-per-view last year, Bay Vigo, um, they've lost the Eliminators, who opened the show winning the titles. Um, they don't have a mission of the pro deal anymore, so like we've lost asset, um, access to like Tasuke, Dick Togo, Tekken Chinoku. Um, and they don't have Terry Funk, who is the champion coming out of that. They don't have Raven, who is a big star. Um, they don't have Big, um, big Stevie Cool or um, Sandman. Oh, they do have Sandman, but they don't have Big Stevie Cool, so like of the four people in the main event, they've lost three of them. Yeah, I mean it's it's not a great time, but you look at what they have got. I mean the crowd was electric. The 
talent that they have is great. And obviously they've got the deal with Frontier Martial Arts Pro Wrestling as well. So they are able to bring in foreign talent such as Hayabushi later on. Um, Hayabushi. Hayabushi. Is that what I called him then? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Hayabusa is what I meant. Sorry. It's, cause I'm, it's because I keep thinking ha- Hakushi. Because Rob Van Dam kept making reference to Hakushi in his promo, and it keeps throwing me. <laughs> um, anyway, we open with our first match with Justin Credible, who is joined by Chastity, Jason, the sexiest man in the world, and Nicole Bass, uh, defeating Jerry Lynn in 14 minutes and 36 seconds in what was, I believe, a decider in the summer series, Chris. Yeah, it's, it's, an, it's not really an official series. They kind of just had three matches, and this is the third one. And we were just like, ah, it's a series. Um, very quickly, um, first time I saw Jason on ECW TV, I literally thought it was Buff Bagwell. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I can see that. He looks like a really weathered Buff Bagwell, though. <laughs> like buff, like today, Buff, like Gigolo. Buff yeah. Bagwell. Oh, yeah. He had proper leathery skin. That would be Buff Bagwell. Anyway, do continue. Two after me, by the way, with a um, cage match rating of three. What's that? Who's that? Chastity has a cage match rating of three. However, she has a U-Porn rating of... I'm joking, she hasn't got a U-Porn rating, but she was kicked out of WCW for doing porn. So uh, there you go, a little tidbit for you. <laughs> I mean, my Hulk Hogan, so that's a bit... Hulk Hogan's wasn't uh... porn. Don't say that. It makes me feel dirty. <laughs> And lastly, um, Nicole Bass. Got to be a matter of jokes, me about Nicole oh, Bass. Joey Styles really wants you to know that he doesn't fancy Nicole Bass, which makes you think that he does. I think my favourite quote from this entire thing was the following quote that I've written down. This is what Joey Styles said about Nicole Bass. We should call her Russia because she's so much bigger than China. Bigger than China. Oh, um, she was actually in WWF for a time. She was. Um, she was there in WrestleMania, one of the WrestleManias, wasn't she? Yeah, and then she left because you know they already had a China. And um, apart, if I remember rightly, she sued the Brooklyn Brawler for sexual harassment. Fucking hell! That's an unattractive image. <laughs> I, I know, but yeah, um, the. The story going in this is basically Credible and Lynn are fighting to go to that next level, both of which, both of whom would be at that and like around next year. Like Credible is the future ECW champion and Jerry Lynn would have that legendary feud with RVD. So like they were very they're like these are the um on the precipice of big things, these two. Um just incredible wasn't popular in newsletters at the time. Cause he sucks. <laughs> 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 I mean, Does he? I mean, I know he was a little bit shit in WWF, but he was put under a jock strap and made to be the Portuguese man of war. So I, I think I preferred him there. Did you notice, by the way, his got milk um, t shirt? It just said got blood. Yeah. I hate the 90s. Anyway, <laughs> the match. Um, Garth, what did you think of the match? I enjoyed it. I really enjoyed it. Um, I've always. Always enjoyed Jerry Lynn. I thought, like, thinking about it at the time, and I mean, even now, like, he was exciting to watch. He did stuff that not many people were doing on a regular basis in like the American wrestling scene. Um, not not in like the main sort of on the on the main, especially in, like late nineties on anything other than like the cruiserweight division in WCW. Um, but I enjoyed the match. I thought. Just incredible was fine, like he did his part, but um I just liked um stuff like that the cheeky little chair shot where they held the chair across him when the ref was sort of I mean the refs were pretty much pointless anyway. <laughs> <laughs> the amount of fucking the amount of just like disregard for the rules, but um I just thought like he had the classic beer shot which I think we had with three matches maybe. Mm-hmm. Uh and we had like Jerry Lynn just being quite believable and pretty fucking snug as well. Uh, even some of those like Hurricane Runners look like fucking hurt, and normally it looks phony as hell. Um, I love the um, 
like the top rope runner to the outside table. That was fucking, that was an, one of many sort of holy shit moments. Um, and I just thought that top rope fucking tombstone as well was dangerous but exciting. <laughs> I just thought really, I really enjoyed it. I thought the just it was a perfect opener, just to get like it was quite high intensity and just yeah, good show. Chris. This is fine. Like they tried to stuff a bit too much into the fairly short amount of time they had. Like had the um, interference kind of fuck with the cadence of the match, and interference can work. We still have saw that in the next match where like interference can work to benefit your match. Where it's here, it kind of just was even ruined the flow. Oh, was stupid. For example, oh, it's funny because um, Nicole Bass got hit in the testicle. She has testicles. Yeah, that was a bit shit. Yeah, it's basically low blow but funny for women. Um, the ECW crowd uh, cunts. Um, seriously, when um, there's a moment in this match where like Jerry Lynn hesitates for a second before he does like a jump over into a, a cold red type thing, and it was really cool, but he hesitates for like half a fucking second, and he gets you fucked up shots. Whereas later in the match, we see Hayabusa and Sabu in a ring fucking... Apparently, they just can't hit a move, but they're very forgiving to them because, you know, they're fucking internet darlings. Fuck off. Um, also, the ECW crowd love it when women get hurt. Oh, yeah. Absolutely love it. <laughs> it's like if a fucking incel forum ended up in a fucking wrestling arena. Yeah, that chastity spot got possibly the biggest pop of the night, including New Jack. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, yeah, like, um, the ending was actually, like, it was surprisingly well set up. It's very hard to make a top rope tune so natural. And, like, that was fairly natural. Because that's how Jerry Lynn goes for his Hurricane Runner anyway. So, yeah, everyone looked good. It's just they tried to do too much in 15 minutes. Um, I've got a couple of things to say, but I overall thought it was a really, really entertaining opener. Um, I've, I've never had a problem with Just Incredible as a worker, to be perfectly honest. I think he got saddled with a couple of terrible gimmicks in the WWF, but I know that he did have a good, a relatively good run in uh, ECW. Um, again, that... Hurricane Rana to the outside through a table. Fucking hell. Oh, my God. <laughs> um, I did find myself... And again, this is just me on ECW generally. I found, to start with, the lack of selling very, very jarring. Um, yeah. Because, obviously, you know, I'm I'm not used to that style of wrestling. Um, I got used to it, and, you know, it didn't hamper my enjoyment of the show. Uh, but it was, it was in this match where I thought, fucking hell, you know, he's just been DDT'd onto a chair and we're nowhere near the fucking finish. Um, overall, a really, really, like say, a really fast-paced, snug opener. Um, that tombstone off the top rope, fucking hell. I genuinely thought that was a worse <laughs> bump than the table bump. You know, that's that's not nice to take on your knees, or if you're the person who's in that position. I don't care how high up you are, that's still not a pleasant bump to take. Um, yeah. yeah, overall, a really, really good match. I haven't really got anything bad to say about it. The the abuse of Nicole Bass got a little bit much at times. Um, but yeah, I gave it seven altogether. I gave it six. I went seven, yeah. All right. Sorry, Chris. That's the way democracy works. <laughs> um, I live in Scotland. I have a very different thing of democracy than you do. But... Um... My but the last thing said before like fading to black here was Nicole Bass. Ugh. Yeah. Poor woman. She did nothing. All she literally did was exist. That's literally it. From all accounts, she seems to have been a lovely woman as well. And by the way, just to clarify what I said earlier when I said that's un- that's not a very attractive image. I was talking about the Brooklyn Brawler. Um. So we move on from this match and we kick into our second match, which is Chris Candido defeating Lance Storm in 11 minutes. Chris Candido, who is accompanied by his fiance at the time, Tammy Lincich, who of course is Sonny from the WWF. Tammy, of course, having just four days before this show released from the WWF. So Chris, would you like to give us a little bit of insight into this match? So, about five weeks ago, these two lost their belts to Sabu and RVD. They were already having issues because um, Chris Candido is in the triple threat with um, Shane Douglas and Bam Bam Bigelow, and Lance Storm was left out. And then after that, Lance Storm started to develop a personality, what a thought. Um, 
So after losing the tag titles, they got put into a match with um, the BWL. But um, Lance Storm refused to wrestle the BWL because he takes wrestling seriously. Um, <laughs> I should point out the week before he got destroyed by Taz. Um, not, not also not helping it is Chris Candido almost lost his ear in an accident in Boston. And during a backstage promo when Storm was flailing his arms about, he he kept accidentally hitting um, Candido's ear. See, <laughs> so, I, I thought Chris that that was a I thought that was a work. I didn't actually realize that he'd had this horrendous injury. I thought it was all just a joke. And then I read somewhere that this was actually a thing and he almost lost his ear and he had to have it surgically repaired. And I'm like, fucking hell, that's a gnarly thing. I mean, it, um, even with the protection on, that must have been insanely painful. And the protection but, didn't exactly last long, did it? Yeah, but during this promo, um, so Bush Clinton was like, where do you keep hitting my ear? It's like, what do you... And Lance Storm was like, what, do you not trust me? So Lance Storm took a chair from someone put it down, went up, was like, this is how much I trust you, man, and went back. And then the next week he turned on him during a match with Avidi and Sabu. <laughs> but, yeah, that's how, that's how we got there. It was actually, this is actually one of the most fun build-ups on the show. Like, I loved, there was a line by Shane Douglas in one of the shows where it's like, uh, as soon as I reject Lance Storm, he decides to grow a personality. <laughs> oh, gosh. <laughs> Dude, it's not as bad as, um, like, if you, apparently on the ECW One Night Stand DVD, there's a, J, you know how JBL was there on that show? Um, there's a, you can turn on his comedy track because he was mic'd. And he's just abusing Lance Storm all night. He was like, you, Lance Storm couldn't sell out an arena where they gave away three beer with three tickets. Wow. Savage. It's the, it's the thing that everyone says about Lance Storm, isn't it? That Lance Storm would have been the top guy in a company if he'd got, you know, the promo chops, or if he got, you know, well, I hate to say the personality, because in ring, as proved by this match, he was fucking great in ring. I mean, in the, the build up to this match, he, again, he was probably my, one of my favorite parts, like in terms of like promo games going up to this. The only people who really beat him were Taz and RBD. Yeah. So he's one of the top guys, really. Yeah. Like, honestly, I think the only reason he didn't get pushed more is because he was in WCW not long after this. Can we just as well, and it's something I've never really noticed, Lance Storm was fucking jacked in this match. Oh, yeah. I he, was always, know, like, he was like, always like, proper hench. He was enormous. He's, a, he's, a, like, he's like, small, but built. Um, also, very quickly, before we go into the match, two things I want to know. First of all, the highway to hell dub. It's possibly the worst thing I've ever heard in my life. Oh, it's awful, isn't it? Oh, God. It's unbelievably awful. And also, I like when Tammy comes out and Joey Styles is shouting, what a coup! Did you know about the Shane Douglas? And I'm like, but they're getting married. They probably, she probably comes to shows fairly often. Hmm. Well, yeah. Um, there's a, well, let, I'll, uh, I'll talk about Tammy in a moment. Um, Garth, going into this match... I know that you were a huge fan of this match. I just thought it was a really good because Chris. I mean, the both the both kind of the same sort of level of people where they're technically and like probably at the time some like best workers around, but they just didn't have the sort of character. Like Chris Candido was a bit better than Lance Storm, but. Storm sort of, well, it's widely regarded as one of the least interesting people. But I think when the match gets started and, and not having followed the story beforehand, taking just on the match, I just thought it was like a solid, just a, a really good showing of good wrestling. It's weird to say, like, especially in a in an event like this where it is mostly spots and hardcore stuff. Um, this kind of sort of stood out as the, maybe it's the most r- normal wrestler match. Um, I just like the stuff like the um, the stiffness of it all again. It, it was quite sort of believable. Um, the, that f- over the top suplex that Lance Storm gives him, and uh, and he hits his head on the back of the ring. Oh no! And you just think, ugh, like that. that that's not pleasant. Um, and the bit where the ref just gets absolutely sparked out by Candido, <laughs> <laughs> but then just gets up. It's like no, like no sells the punch. Uh, 
just I like all that stuff. Um, they had the daft little sort of um, the powder thing where the ref just looked and went, eh. <laughs> <laughs> again, it's just like, why are you there? <laughs> um, What's the point of you? Yeah. Um, and the bit where the ref grabbed Sonny as well. And it's like, are you actually actively trying to rip my top off here? Like, yes. And then someone had, someone had to come and sort of cover her up. Um, it, it, it just it was just a fun match, and then that uh, that what they call it the blonde bomb, the blonde bombshell or something like the that. The blonde bombshell right. and off the top row. No, absolutely no, 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 no. <laughs> I replayed that move three times, and just you what. Lance Storm taking that move and he hits his back. I mean, this is a top rope powerbomb, basically. A top rope release powerbomb where release. there's yeah. no control from Candido of Lance Storm. Basically, he just throws Lance Storm and hopes he doesn't land on his neck. And he hits his back first, but he's obviously from the top rope, so there's a lot of sort of there's a lot of momentum. So he then hits his head on the canvas as well, but he it's yeah. like a proper bang, bang. And it's just like, oh, no, absolutely fucking not. No, no, no. If you don't like head trauma, you must have really hated the next match. Oh, my um, God. No, don't even get me started on that. Just quickly, Chris, um, before I throw to you, what, Garth, what was your opinion of the, I don't want to say the campy way we led to the finish, you know, the blind new Candido, him accidentally rolling up the ref and things like that. Yeah. What did you think about that? I thought it was alright, it was fine. Um it's kinda came out of nowhere though, like like the power and stuff. Why what did that have to do with any of them? But I kinda guessed that that was why Tammy was there, she had to get involved. Um I just yeah, it didn't really sort of detract from it because I mean the actual finisher, like that move, fucking that would sort of finish off anybody and it was just yeah, well, it was another one of those holy shit, what the fuck sort of thing. Um, I just thought it was really fun, and I like, like, this is one of the ones where they dubbed in the um, the music, wasn't it? Because they used um, AC Kyrie style. Yeah, um, I just thought it was fun, a really sort of solid match. Like, uh, I was, it's quite sad because I was looking into uh, like sort of Chris Candido and. I didn't realise that when he died, he was only 33 years old. Yeah, he was only young. So fucking hell. And he died of um, pneumonia? Yeah, it was like a blood clot, wasn't it? He'd had surgery, Following an yeah. um, ankle injury or something. So sad. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But it's a quality match. Really enjoyed it. <laughs> One thing I forgot to mention um, was Tammy's ring introduction of Candy. Oh my God, she sounded so fucking rough. It's not just <laughs> that. It's, it's how she describes him. Um, weighing in at 240 of the hardest pounds I've ever felt. <laughs> <laughs> was anyone else thinking, though, you were literally with Shawn Michaels not three months ago? Yeah. Um, I I try not to think about because it. Because she, so, you... she was, like, openly with Shawn Michaels because her and Candido weren't together. No. Um, the story of Sunny is quite a tragic one. The decline of Sonny is horrendous. And again, it's something that we could dedicate an entire fucking podcast episode to. I'd rather not, because at that point, we'd probably have to review a fucking porn, and I'd rather not. I mean, <laughs> Chris, if we ever get to the point on this podcast where we have to review Sonny Side Up, um, I'm good. I, that's the, that's, that's <laughs> yes. the moment we stop the podcast. Yeah, just call it a day. We'll see, we'll see each other once a year in black. Yeah, and then we'll never talk about it. It's like one night in China. If we ever do a retrospective in Ch- of China, I never, ever, ever want it to include <laughs> X-Pax bollocks, ever. No, thanks. <laughs> exactly. We took a turn. So, yeah, this match, I, thought this match, I thought this match flowed much better than the last one. Like, gas, right? Everything sort of was believable. There was no botches. What I did like was Lance Storm refused to take any bad bumps. He's like, no, 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 no. I have prospects. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, it was, it was fine. Um, I do agree that the top row powerbomb could have been safer, but like considering what else is on the show, it, it kind of just blended in. Um, but I thought Stunny's interference was a tad more natural than the last one. Like the last one, like sort of gone away, whereas Tammy was more of a distraction than anything else. Um, yeah, this is, this is fine. Absolutely fine. Like a nice little 10 minute match. Yeah. I gave this eight. I thought it, you know, it was, it was wrestled at a similar pace to the previous match, but I thought there was more in this match to give it a higher grade. So I went eight. 
I went seven because like of uh, 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 about my brain, I couldn't think of a ton special, but it was really solid. I've got a, I've got an ear for that one. God, honestly, look at us! <laughs> oh my god. Um. Anyway, <laughs> so again, sorry, Chris. That's that's uh, that's. Democracy for you. Um, I was going to say a dictatorship. That's a different thing. <laughs> That's both <okay. laughs> well. Literally the opposite. <laughs> um, so at this point, and again, I'm sure Chris will provide some uh, some context to this in a moment, but we go to a pre taped sort of angle where New Jack is in the car park. Um, he gets into a fight with Jack Victory. They were supposed to have some manner of weapons match tonight, though in ECW, aren't they all weapons matches? Um, it's never really explained why the match is cancelled. You assume it's because of the beatdown. Um, but the Dudley boys arrive um, in their purple car, which is just fucking class. It's so 90s. It they all get out, beat the shit into um, New Jack, and then the Dudleys drive off, and Axel Rotten is literally cradling New Jack, just screaming for a doctor, and it is the most over-the-top thing on this entire show. Yes, I'm not being sarcastic, but it's great. Um, the best thing about this is, like, they're all, like, like up to this point, we've had F-bombs and everything. And during this video, so beep, 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 beep. <laughs> it's like, why are you beeping Well, it? this is something that's amazing. Garth, you're absolutely right. Up until this point, we've bleeped everything. And then yeah. we just get apparently the guy is either too lazy to do the rest of the bleeps or he can't hear them because we get especially there's one in the RVD promo where they just full on just go fuck it fuck it fuck it (laughs) Shane Douglas does right at the very start when he says cut the fucking music yeah there's about four or five accounts of where they just openly say the word fucking and it's not blocked so I don't know if they just had a certain amount of things they had to bleep or something because this it was like bleep 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 fuck bleep 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 shit bleep 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 fuck 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 bleep 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 <laughs> so yeah very very strange um, the, of all the, of all the things DCW was good at production value wasn't one of them um, just before I let Chris talk about um, this I'm gonna do these two promos together uh, we then cut backstage uh, to Bill Alfonso Rob Van Dam as Sabu Rob Van Dam is both the television champion um, halfway through his record breaking reign um, well not even halfway through I think he was three months three months into it or something like that um, and he was one half of the tag champions with Sabu they were sort of reluctant champions uh, Bill Alfonso goes it just makes out like he doesn't know who um Hayabushi, Hayab- oh my god, I keep calling him that, for <laughs> fuck's sake. Hayabusa and Jinsei Shinzaki are, oh, just keeps calling them Japanese losers. Rob Van Dam puts himself over, which I'm not going to lie, is fucking hilarious. I was laughing my head off. I that. thought he was just great. Saying, uh, this is the point where he kept saying, yeah, everybody's here to see you because you're my partner. <laughs> it, it was so funny just to see Sabu get more and more and more angry. Um, he keeps slapping his arms down. This has been happening for a month. Like, literally, Abedi will only ever compliment um, Sabu if it's like a backhand compliment towards himself. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> and then, of course, we get RVD sneezing the word Hakushi, uh, because obviously Jinsei Shinzaki is Hakushi from the WWF, famous for his <laughs> feud with Bret Hart. Um, Chris, can you give us some context to these two promo sections? Right, okay, so we need Jack one first. He and Jack Victory were meant to have a weapons match. That's literally just what it was. And it was heavily advertised. Um, New Jack, basically, we just keep hitting each other and they're sick of hitting each other. So we're going to hit each other more. It's, I never said it was a deep feed. Um, <laughs> ECW. New Jack, cut, EC dub. <laughs> New Jack cut one of the promos of his life. Um, he was on a subway car because, like, I, I doubt they had like a permit. I think they just went on the subway because you could hear people in the background, and he had to like move out the way at one point because people came on. Amazing. It was it was great. But he was like, um, I've been behind bars and I have a co- I have a and I have a graduate degree. What are you gonna do when someone can go both ways and doesn't give a fuck? And it was great. <laughs> um, just yeah, they just kept attacking each other, and then like they decided, you know what, we're not gonna have this match. Despite the fact I, it, we had to like talk it out, we had about half an, an hour of people trying to fill space on this card. So like we could have still had the match, 
both men turned up anyway. So like why we didn't have it, I will never know. Um, and and then Viavidi and Sabu Kremo, yeah, they, they basically just don't like each other, but they work well together. Bolonfonda works with them. Um, RVD is great because like he sort of goes, I'm ready for the big time. He's like the only person on this card who's clever about his insider references because like he doesn't burn any bridges to WWE. So like that's probably why we treat him a bit better than the other ECW guy when he turned up. Mm-hmm. Like for example, when he turned here a year ago at Barely Legal, he turned to the camera and said, just this man right here does my bookings, and I love to work one day. <laughs> <laughs> and, yeah. and it's just like this. And by the way, have you noticed that um, what the belts are? No. What are they? The, the, I, the tag belts are IC titles. Really? And the um, TV belt is for Winged Eagle. I noticed, I did notice, actually, I did notice that because I looked at it and I thought, no, that can't be right. <laughs> He literally does have replica belts that they fucking taped up. That's amazing. Nice. I mean, that, to be fair, does sort of fit the whole underground theme of ECW, in fairness. Yeah, they did get their own custom ECW title, so, like, and, like, they would change, they would have, like, their own thing, and, like, if the ECW TV belt didn't look bad, the tag belts were a bit horrendous, but but those be, that, that how it be. Amazing. Um, I I did forget that um, RVD referred to himself as three quarters of the tag team champions, which really did fucking make me laugh. That just this this um, promo because he wasn't ridiculous. He was, probably was high, but it he wasn't ridiculously almost <laughs> incomprehensibly high. And that just it he was he was so he was so heelishly lovable that I just, I couldn't hate him. I thought he was I thought he was fucking great. I really did. <laughs> It was a, a nice little mix between um, TNA RVD and WWE RVD. It was like a nice middle. Exactly, exactly. He wasn't just constantly making out with his girlfriend slash wife. Mm. Um, so we... Slash random women. <laughs> we then go to our third match with Masato Tanaka defeating Mike Awesome in 11 minutes and 49 seconds. Um, Chris, off you go. So these two fight a lot in FMW, and so why not in ECW? Is basically the feud. They had a random match on ECW TV, which is actually really good. As you sort of expect, these two they're like the etern- they're like eternal rivals thing, like Dragon Lee versus Hiromu Takahashi, um, and they work really well together. But yeah, like the main crux of this feud is they just don't like each other. We had two matches up to this point. Well, in ECW TV, where Tanaka won with a roaring elbow, and like me- immediately after. Awesome jumps back up um, and power, bo- did, you know, the, like the awesome bomb through the table out of the ring. Mm-hmm. Did that yep. and Tanaka's head almost hit the railing. It was fucking disgusting. And then they had a tag match on TV. It was Tanaka and um, J. Willen versus Just Incredible and Awesome. And that was really good. Although, um, without Tanaka's debut, it was literally only five weeks before this. It was against Boris Bohoni. And they just hit each other in the head with chairs the whole time, like literally the whole time. <sighs> it is disgusting. Somehow Tanaka is still going, and Tanaka is still amazing. And he's still, I checked, and he still looks like well, he looks relatively young still. He he works like well, like he his KOD um, open weight run from this year in DVT to best championship run all year. Like every single match is a hit. Like and, and like most of them, and like only one of them is below eight out of ten. Mm. So like he's still like amazingly good. He's never not been amazing, which is insane. Because when you think of like who took the most punishment in this match, it was him. Was it? Yeah. Totally. Was it though? I mean, Austin took one bad bump, and the rest of it was all awesome. one. Like how many times? One bad bump. <laughs> But, like, think about the, the amount of times that Tanaka got smashed in the head of the chair. What Not bad only here. Bump? <laughs> we'll get to it, Robert. Good God. Sorry, do continue. Um, so, going on to this match, yeah, like, there's, it's another one of those matches with not a ton of build up. It's just these two hated each other in Japan and it's spilled over into America. That's essentially it. Um, these two, like, the. I don't know how, quite how know how to describe their chemistry, other than they don't like the other one having cognitive thought. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah like, you're not wrong. They, they, it's, they're one of those, they have no restraint. Like, there was a take a dive from Awesome like a minute into this match. For, mm-hmm. And then there was like a lightsaber fight with chairs, which I loved. I don't think you two are going to love that, but I love that shit. And then sick headshot, so many sick headshots. Like, oh my God, I, how did Tanaka not get a concussion? Um, and yeah, I did, I did like the spot where Tanaka like got the chair and like ran at um, Awesome. <laughs> I really like that. All the way down mm-hmm. the ramp. Yeah, I like, I, I kind of imagine like what if FMW ever ran the Tokyo Dome? I bet he'd do that. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine and that. Easy thing. Um, Goth, aside from, you know, the the shared thought that I think we all have that Mike Awesome has got the greatest mullet in the history of the world. <laughs> um, the fat chick. The fat chick thriller. Oh, my God. <laughs> He's another one who was labelled with just a fucking abhorrent gimmick. WWE always did, like, you have um, Mike Awesome, right? So he's like, what, 6 foot 10, 6 foot 11, um, powerful as anything, agile as anything. And so, like, you could fr- throw him in there, have him have great matches with cruiserweights, and then, like, eventually build up to some of the bigger guys. Um, but no, what do we do first? Like, and they pair him in the, with the one guy in WCW who's taller than him. It's just ridiculous. Absolutely ridiculous. Um, Goth, <laughs> what do you think of this match? Um, I thought it was just another good, fun match. Like, I really enjoyed it. It was, um, because it was totally different to the previous match. Um, and it was just two big dudes leathering the shit out of each other. Um, and like Tanaka's just full covered in fucking scars. Yeah, and so F&W, was Hayabusa as well. F and W is a death match promotion. Well, it does a lot of death matches. It's fucking crazy. Um, now I love the that dive the outside dive by Mike Awesome. Well, he just kept doing it. <laughs> just like. This guy was absolutely massive, like close to 300 pounds, and it was like, how can I do this stuff? Um, and the bit where tonight I just kept no selling stuff, like big suplexes and stuff, and he just jumps up. <laughs> but like normally that would piss you off, but you just think these two guys are just two big hosses who just refuse to give in. Um, and like, I don't know if you, I, either you notice, but I notice every time either. They did like top rope stuff, or they were slamming each other in the in the ring. It looked like the ring was going to cave in. Like <laughs> in the middle, it was flexing so much. I was like, "This is going to this is going to give way here." Honestly, um, I think that's more um, ECW having a very low budget then. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But it kind of played into it because I was watching. It, I was thinking these moves look absolutely brutal. Um, and when they had that chair fight. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I just, honestly, it was one of those matches where I just watched it and it, the time seemed to absolutely fly because it was just a fun match. Um, and those chair shots, like the head shots that tonight was taking were fucking brutal. Like, it's hard watching that now, knowing what we know. Um, and I mean, there's quite a few in this pay per view, but those ones, especially, you just stood there and took it. Um, and I noticed you in this match, and I wrote it down even here, and I was like, I don't know if either used it either. But Shane Douglas, for some reason, kept reminding us of Jesse Ventura. <laughs> he sounded just like I'm him. not going to lie. I like, thought he did a great job on commentary, to be fair. Oh, it was really good, eh? Um, Shane Douglas is much better on commentary than he is as a wrestler. <laughs> well, he's better than he was in WWF as Dean Douglas. Um, in, in Easy W, he would tell us, he would tell us big, big shit. Absolutely like, not watchable. And then that, um, like, that way to knock with that, basically the razor's edge over the top rope was just that. Was it? I was like, holy fucking hell, man. Where can they go from here? That's actually my favourite part about this match is, like, even though we've only been feuding in ECW for a month, they've already built layers on top, like, on top of this feud. Mm-hmm. Like, for example, like, that was revenge for what happened to Awesome, um, what happened to Tanaka the first time we met in ECW. And Tanaka tried to do that in the ECW arena, but like couldn't pull it off. Yeah. So like this is Tanaka finally getting the revenge of that, and then like roaring up all the finished after them last time, um, didn't do it, so he had to escalate again. That's it. It was like every, yeah, like every every move was like, what else do I have to do to, to take this guy down? And we're having to 
sort of outdo each other on the on the sort of power moves. But then um, the DDT onto the chair for the win, and I just thought it was a really good match. And I haven't really seen that much of Mike Awesome, but I just think it's again it's another one of those ones where he just sort of left too young, didn't he? Like pretty. Sad. He died in two thousand six, two thousand seven. Yeah, hung himself. Didn't yeah. He? Yeah, it wasn't. It, um, it wasn't a nice one. <laughs> no. So, but no, I really, really enjoyed this match. Like, it's just, I don't know, like, up to this point, the match quality just seemed to get better. Every match was better than the last. Yeah, I agree. Uh, really enjoyed it. Um, yeah, I, to be honest, I can't really see, I can't really add anything else apart from the fact that fucking hell, just that bump, oh my God. I mean, it... <laughs> Tanaka is not tall enough to be delivering that move. No, I, especially f- like standing and picking him up like deadlift style. Which was impressive. Don't get me wrong. I mean, the table itself for ages. You knew one of them was going to go out, and um, you know, from even earlier on in the show when Lance Storm suplexes uh, Candido out of the ring, you know that they're not scared of launching each other out of the ring. Um, mm-hmm. It's not just no mats, and that like, was the thing. Joey Styles. That was the thing. Joey Styles continuously wet. like I understand like it's not like a mat isn't like oh isn't gonna make it not hurt but it's gonna make you not cave your head in yeah. <laughs> and Joey Styles kept going oh we don't do mats here because we're not a pussy promotion or whatever it's like stop bragging about not having a budget <laughs> it was just the impact the way he took it all on his neck and just the back of his head. It was it was gross. It it was gross. Um but yeah, apart from that, it was quite literally as Garth said, hoss men doing hoss things. Um it was great. Um awesome for someone who is nine foot twelve is surprisingly agile, which makes him even more compelling to watch. And like you said, Garth, I wish he'd gone on to do more. Um, you know, he deserved more because here he was he was fantastic, especially in his partnership with Tanaka, which I know they go on to have other fantastic matches as well. Um, Chris, do you, have you got anything to add before we do ratings? Um, look at Miss out Tanaka's DBT run. Fair enough. Um, Chris, what did you give this? Um, eight. I gave it nine. I give it eight. Eight. Eight it is, then. Eight it is. That's the way democracy works, Chris. See? You win some, you lose some. What I will say very quickly is, like, these first three matches prove that you can have really good matches in under half an hour. Take notes. Every fucking company right now. (laughs) So, once we've done with this, we get a Taz promo. Um, He cuts a promo saying that the FTW title is the one that means something, uh, which is ironic as they introduce it as an unlicensed title. Um, he calls out <laughs> he calls out Austin, he calls out Goldberg, and he calls out Mike Tyson um, in what was an absolutely amazing promo. Um, again, we'll go into the next promo and then we'll analyze them all together. Uh, we then cut to the Dudleys and Joel Gurner who proceed to cut one of just an absolutely amazing promo. Bubba Ray Dudley talking about how Tommy Dreamer sacrificed himself for the sins. Um, you can you can give yourself to Jesus, but your ass belongs to the Dudleys. What a, what a <laughs> fucking line that is. Um, just unbelievably intense. The entire thing about, you know, it's your cross to bear. It, it was great. Really, really great. This is, of course, all stemming from the fact that the Dudleys tried to absolutely butcher Tommy Dreamer's wife, um, which we'll get into in a moment. Um, Chris, would you like to add anything about the Taz promo and um, the religious Dudleys promo with, sorry, with <laughs> Devon Dudley shouting testify? Um, in the Taz one, um, this is a long thing of Taz, um, great Taz promos. I'll explain what, like, the whole backstory behind the FCW belt when we get to the match, but, yeah, Taz going into this has been doing great. He's basically, the promos has been hyping himself up, because his tagline is, like, um, what was it? Survive if I, it's, when it, um, beat me if you can, survive if I like you. <laughs> and, but, hey, that's fucking great. 
V, um, because Bam, uh, because Bam Bam kind of beat beat him at the last table. He's kind of been trying to psych himself up, going, "I didn't get the chance to let you survive, so I'm going to let you survive." I did like how he went like the pay per view stars of the day and not um, just wrestling stars in like the attempt to make him seem more legitimate. Like I like that, like just tiny little touch. I don't know if Mike Tyson's a big pay per view draw at the time. Like was this after, before or after he bit the ear off of the van der Holy? Um. 98 that was that was wrestlemania 14 so that was where um so it's basically so basically mike tyson's time as a boxer had been and gone at that point no he was still the hottest thing he was still the hottest thing he was still the hottest thing but like as a, it's, it's sort of like how now conor mcgregor's the hottest, um, hottest thing in mainstream mma but like he barely fights uh, that's basically the point that um tyson was in at that point when was this 98 yeah I mean, this is when he was at the height. He was at the height, but he was at all the controversy came out. I think it must have been must have been around that time when the um, was not the rape charges and stuff. Was it? So, good that? times for uh, Mike Tyson. The whole ear biting, <laughs> the whole rape thing. He's <laughs> the whole rape. A fucking scary bloke, isn't he? Jesus Christ. He's not. Like, it's well, I'll say if anyone has a tattoo, like, on their face, not, like, on their forehead as a, like, a bald thing, like, on their actual face. Yeah, kind of scary. Kind was, of scary. He, yeah. I'm sure it was 97 when he does the... Well, the e-bike. How's none of us Google this yet? <laughs> the um, man owns a fucking tiger. Does he? Yeah, he's got a pet tiger. Of course he's fucking terrifying. I didn't know that. Anyway, um... <laughs> Mike is off it. Um, anyway, um, <laughs> the Dudley promo. Um, yeah, it's just great. Like again, that line. Um, I wrote it down verbatim. You can give your heart to Jesus, but your ass belongs to the Dudley boys. Ah, oh. just amazing. Oh. And Joe Gertman is Joe. He's certainly Joe Gertman. He's yeah. He's great. We'll we'll, we'll get to Joe Gertman, believe me. Um, But yeah, I'll go into more of the backstories behind both these when we get into their matches. Although next, the story is very easy to go through because there is none. Um, RVD and Sabu are the champions. They've been saying for weeks, oh, this is a world championship. Anyone from the world... (laughs) Well, it was actually a funny problem. Anyone in the world can um, challenge us from Britain, from Japan, from Vietnam. And then Bill Alfonso went, um, uh, too soon, man, too soon. It's like, man, you weren't even in Vietnam. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we move on to the aforementioned tag team title match with the champions, Rob Van Dam and Sabu, with Bill Alfonso, defeating Hayabusa and Jinsei Shinzaki in 20 minutes and 51 seconds. Now, before we give our thoughts on this, um, Dave Meltzer gave this two stars Fuck. In Observer speak, that's average. Like he's always said, two stars is like an average. Yeah, match. which I personally disagree with. But Garth, I'll let you talk about this because I know you were high on this match. Uh, it's another one. It's it's another one that just um, ramped up the intensity and the oh, I wouldn't say quality, but I would say spot and story even there was even story in here um especially at the end of the match which i thought was really good really smart um where spoilers where um sabu well rvd is about the pin at the end and then sabu like pushes him away to get the pin and it's sort of that little those little bits throughout the match really sort of helped it um but that guy oh fuck man uh, thingy with the whistle was doing me to <laughs> Bill Alonso. <laughs> oh my god, he was doing the fucking head in. Um all the way through it. Um I just it's just all the little bits that R V D kept doing where he's just refusing to tag Sabu in. Um it's just sort of like looking at him going, nah I'm fine. <laughs> <laughs> um and like Sabu I mean R V D doing his moves and just sort of like sort of played to the crowd. But then Sabu came in and he was just trying to pin every moment, every opportunity he tried to pin, which I thought was really good. Um, just, just trying what he could to get the, the thing in. Watching this, I was watching. I was like, like, yes, yeah, Sabu used to be really good, didn't he? <laughs> like, you forget because 
in the later life, he just became this like com- like a, a parody of himself. Um, but I just there was just loads of was just loads of good spots. Like, and I'm not normally like a f- total spot fest fan, but I thought this really worked. Um, even the tandem moves where, for instance, like the so we had him in the camera clutch and RVD did the sort of top rope, well not the sort of springboard drop kick thing, like all that sort of stuff was really good. Um, and to be honest, I thought like Hayabusa and Shinzaki really really good as well. Um, I always liked um, Hakushi when he was in WWF anyway. Um, but I just no, yeah, really really good. Where RVD was selling the knee, that was really good. Um, and they kept sort of targeting it for a while and yeah it, what i mean at one point as every match does the rules just went out the window and there was no tag match anymore it became like a tornado um, tag ecw tag matches are tornado they try they usually make it clear on other pay-per-views but like they're doing the normal tag thing out of politeness more than anything else right oh, well. um i loved that um spot where they had the both on the table and Sabu and RVD did the double leg drop off the top row. That was really good. RVD um, once almost lost um, his eyelid on a spot like that. How? No, seriously, like a piece of table went through it and he reached up and he was like, oh, I wonder what's that? It's going to pull off and it was a piece of skin, but it was his eyelid. <laughs> Can I imagine Jesus that? Jesus Christ. <laughs> like, haven't you ever wondered, well, like, is it, it's one of his eyes so like, is always like slightly closed or did he just assume it was a male one? I just thought that was used high all the time. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just didn't, it was just really good like I say I, I keep seeing that in these matches but it was just fun um, like how many Van Dominators were dished out in this match so many <laughs> um, and th- there was a funny bit I don't know if it was part of the match or if it happened where Sabu went to pick up a table and he just stopped and looked at his finger and he was like his finger was hurt and then Hybris just threw him out the ring <laughs> I was like, is that part of the match? Or is he genuinely just hurt his finger picking up a table? <laughs> Everything that they've done in this match and the most dangerous thing was him picking up a table. Yeah, he picked it up and he just stops and he's like, ah. <laughs> well, it's a really good match. It was really, really fun. Uh, Chris. <laughs> I like for that. Like, oh my God. I like, I, when we're in FMW where we have barbed wire exploding death matches, but nah, fuck, it's Splinter. I'm going home. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's exactly what it was like. <laughs> Um, I enjoyed this match not as, not quite as much as Garth I didn't think this flowed like as a collection of moves this was great but I don't think this match especially flowed which you're not really going to get with the Sabu because Sabu like he was better here but like normally he like botches about half of his moves like if he hits 10 moves he'll botch 5 of them yeah and like that's always that's just always how he's been he's not exactly a traditional wrestler but like I don't know, RVD was great back then. Like, you don't realise how slow he got around, like, 2010 until you see, like, his ECW stuff and how fast he used to move. That's uh, that's that's one of the things that I noticed as well. And the same with Sabu as well. Yeah. Um, I'm sure, like, it was great for a lot of, like... Because ECW fans were tape traders, so seeing some Hayabusa in, like, a, in the flash must have been, like, great. Be, it's kind of like when you see, get to, like, Okada or Tanahashi in the flash when they come over here. Um, just... Back then it was harder, and therefore be more entitled about it. 90 smarks are the worst kind of smarks. <laughs> um, but yeah, this is fine. Like again, most of the spots Garth pointed out were ah, great. It's just a main issue is nothing flowed. It kind of just didn't move. Like there was literally a point where Abby is selling and then quickly pops up to do a kick because that's what that's what was meant to happen. Mm-hmm. And then he went back to not selling. There was a great part in this match where like um, Sabu hit a move and then from off camera, RVD came in with a frog flash. That was like great. Like and- that's that's something that I've noted actually where um, they did a and that every single company now is guilty of it where they'll show the shot of an outside dive from the people outside's perspective. Mm-hmm. Whereas on this, that you could tell they were purposely hiding the people out of the camera shot who were obviously standing waiting for the, but because you couldn't see them, it gave the those shots much more impact. Mm-hmm. No, that's thing, as, yeah. That's an annoying thing about a lot of, like, especially, um, AW and WWE are especially guilty of this. 
with high flying moves, they do it to a moving camera. Cameras like um, a lot of places like New Japan are like most places in Japan actually. Um, they show it from like the perspective of whoever's taking the move, so we can actually see the elevation that those people are getting and yeah. it makes the move more impact. So it's more stuff like that that makes like even simple stuff hit harder, even if a move's not done as well. Um, but yeah, like my notes of this aren't extensive unlike the other matches because there's no story and like my motor basically moves a curd. <laughs> yeah, it was it was very spotty. Um there was one point that sort of encapsulates this completely, um, which was <clears throat> Sabu has I think it was Shinzaki in some manner of hold and um R V D comes in, does a backflip just to do a drop kick. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And but it does fit in with Javidi's gimmick because his gimmick right now is basically I'm trying to impress the Brig League so I can actually go somewhere where I can get paid. It, it that though that was a bit pointless. Um, I do I I enjoyed the match as a pure spectacle, which I think is what Chris, where you're coming from, Chris. Um, mm-hmm. but I think if you delve any deeper than that, then you're gonna find little flaws. Um, I did enjoy the tensions between RVD and Sabu, and especially, as you mentioned, Garth, towards the end. Um, Hayabusa was great. Um, I re- his 450 splash was so smooth, so great. Oh, my, my, it actually, actually reminds me, Joy Stars kept getting fucking moves drunk. Like, and it's, he was trying, it's because he was trying to be, like, smarky. Like, for example, Jerry Lynn hit a powerbomb, and he's like, oh, it's a Tiger Driver. No, it's not. Or like um, he caught a four fifty splash, a Stardust splash. Yeah, it wasn't a Stardust splash at all. Um, but even so, I thought it was a good match. It was really enjoyable to watch, and you know this went over twenty minutes, and it did not feel like it did at all. Um, I I gave it I gave it seven. I thought it was great. I I gave it a seven as well. Like it's just, I can only go so far on moves alone. This is probably as far as you can get on. I'll give it an eight. But, oh, I'm happy to go seven. <laughs> like, if you like this gap, you should go check out the. Um, have you ever seen the Dragon Gate Six Man from um, Ring of Honor? What was it Supercard of Honor? Nope. <laughs> um, that's <laughs> nope. It it's on their YouTube and like it's basically like this where it's just non-stop moves. You, you if you like this, you'd enjoy that. It's the Chima match, isn't it? Uh- yeah, there's Shima in it and Dragon Kid and um, there's someone else in it who Dragon we should know, but I can't remember. T-Hawk? Yeah, no, T-Hawk's not in it. We, it doesn't matter. Move okay. On. Um, so, we then go on to the FTW Championship. I believe it was a last man standing match or Falls Count Anywhere match, sorry. Falls Count Anywhere. Uh, well, actually, it was called an ECW death match. It's a, it's a Falls Count Anywhere, anywhere match. Um with yeah. Taz, the champion, defeating Bam Bam Bigelow, one of my all-time favourites, in 30 minutes and 21 seconds. Uh, Chris, context if you please. Right, so, yeah, I, to be honest, I, I, I'm not surprised you didn't get it from the video package. The video package didn't do an amazing job. Like, it was weirdly convoluted. But, like, this is an inherently simple story. So, basically, um, Taz wants Douglas, but Douglas isn't wrestling because he's injured. Um, so Taz, because he feels he's the real world champion, created his own belt, think like Million Dollar Man with the Million Dollar title, or Cody with any title in AEW. Um, he just created that and it's like, this is my belt now. Um, it may not be recognized, but I will defend this belt. Um, he's been going after Bam Bam for ages because Bam Bam is basically um, Douglas's bodyguard. And yeah, that's, literally, that's essentially it. It's he made his own belt um, and he's feuding with Bam Bam because he named Douglas's stable. <laughs> also, like in the pay-per-view before this, um, he was the famous spot where Bam Bam put um, Taz through the ring. Yeah, they did They did replay that, actually, during, the um, during as you mentioned, that uh, that video package narrated by Paul Heyman, which was his only, yes. his only part in this entire show, which was very actually, weird. Actually, you... you- you can see him at the end of this match because he goes out to make sure a doctor goes down to wipe off the blood from Bigelow. I did not know that. Oh, yes. Yeah, I saw that, yeah. Um, so, Garth, opinion on this match? Yeah. This was good, but considering what is the matches that have come before it, it was a bit of a sort of dip. 
And when they went into the crowd, I found myself getting a bit bored. Um, and I know, obviously, at the time, this probably was something that wasn't very typical of a match, but, like, because we've seen it so often, there's only so much you can do outside of the ring. I mean, I like the... Um, when um, Taz did the dive to the outside and then the, the brawled a bit sort of off the ramp. Um, although I did actually like the bit where straight off the bat, Bam Bam just gave Taz an almighty power bomb. Taz just got up and says like "fuck you" uh, and give him like a, an armbar um, and then some clotheslines that looked stiff as hell. Um, I mean, Taz is like quite even against Bambo was quite like an imposing motherfucker because he just looks like a mean bastard um, uh, I mean I've even got it written down outside brawl Z Z Z Z Z but then when it gets back in the ring it gets better and he does a Tazplex through the, the corner table which was a good, good sort of good spot and then, literally from out of nowhere, out that on the ramp, and then the fucking DDT through the ramp, and that—that that was one where I was like, "Shit!" Like, I didn't see that coming at all. It was really well done. Um, and then the end where he just sort of crawls out, and <laughs> it's like they've gone through all of this. Bam Bam slowly making his way to the ring. Obviously, he's sort of hurt. Taz jumps up and legs it down the ramp. <laughs> he jumps on his back. Complete no <laughs> As if nothing's happened. Yeah. Um, and then obviously taps out for the win. Uh, it was, it got better after they did the stupid outside stuff. Um, but uh, that's, that spot at the end was really, really good that, that through the ramp. Because obviously in the vignette before, in the video, it showed you them doing the thing where they went back through the ring, um, which was another good spot. But I mean, it was it was good. It was a good match, but it wasn't. I think it was just, was spoiled with the stuff that came before it. And these two guys were both quite limited at the time. I mean, Taz has always been pretty limited. Um, but That's no way like, to talk about a short man, though. Very... Um, Chris, what about you? Have you got anything to add? If this was. If this match was a sport, it would be football, because it was a match of two halves. Um, Sorry, whoa, 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 uh, whoa, whoa, whoa. Have you just made a football reference? Correctly. (laughs) I mean, like, I I don't watch football. I know it it has two halves. I am so, so impressed with you right now. You're watching films, you're making football references. I mean, like, I I don't watch the sport, but I did go... I, I did... Happy in school. I know that football has teams. Honestly, Chris, I've never been more proud of you right now. Um, but yeah, at the start, it was just um, drawing for the crowd, and it, it was nothing for the first six, seven minutes of this 12 ish minutes match. And then when it got into the ring, it was great. I loved it. I loved it as soon as it got back into the ring, like these two slugging it out. It's, it's my kind of wrestling at that point. And I love it. It's like the complete opposite end of Hoss matches from what we had before, because you can either go completely both to the wall with a Hoss match, or you can have like the stiff, the stiff slugging it out, and that's what this did. Um, Tizer's suplexes are probably the best suplexes going. Like, great. Well, I say, I'd be saying this if it was 1998, but it's not. Uh, <laughs> and then, yeah, the callback to their previous feud going through the ramp, um, with the Uranagi, that was great. And, yeah, Taz running might be a bit stupid, but I did like how um, Taz basically got his win back and his last mo- bit of mojo he needed to full-on challenge Douglas for that title. So, yeah, like, from a story perspective, in the limited, like, sort of bubble I've watched ECW, this was satisfying. And, it honestly, if literally we'd have just cut out this, the first seven minutes of this match, this would have been a great, like, Eight, like it would be as eight out of ten seven minute match like what you get in like Cinderella tournament but no which is a shame but oh, well I, I did overall enjoy it I did enjoy it more than um the just incredible match and I enjoyed it about the same as I did the Candido Storm match so I can't add anything to that to be perfectly honest um I did enjoy 
Shane Douglas's commentary on this, obviously completely throwing any sort of impartiality out the window. Um, I, I enjoyed the, he was going for the ropes <laughs> call that uh, Shane Douglas did at the end. And then, like you mentioned it. Oh, that bit at the end as well. He went mentally he's like, Fuck yeah, this. just threw threw <laughs> threw monitors off the balcony. Um, it was it was great, and this is where, like you said, Chris Taz gets on the microphone and says, "Beat me if you can, survive if I let you." Which you're right. That it's just such a fucking cool line. It really, really is. Yeah. Um, like maybe like he may not be the best worker ever, but like what he does, he does really well. And like he's not meant he does he's not meant to go along because he's meant to be like a legit MMA badass. Yeah. Like, like put this way, Chris Jericho got over in ECW literally because he was the first person to ever be able to suplex Taz. <laughs> it, he wasn't a difficult character, really, at all. But do you know what? I loved it. Um, I didn't even mind that he got out of sort of the hole that they'd, um, you know, metaphorically dug for themselves with the DDT um, and then ran because it was more like adrenaline, sort of this red rage. Yeah. I just laughed at it when it happened. I was like, fucking hell. It's, it's another throwback to when he was the Tasmania. Oh, my God. The fucking worst um, name. I know, but it also, like, so basically how that changed is because he broke his neck and could, there seems to be a running theme in ECW. But um, apparently he, he walked into, he like he walked with the broken neck. He hadn't realised he broke it. Just what? He was like, um, he basically, he took a bad spike power driver, and <laughs> like it must have been adrenaline or something because he walked to the hospital. Wow. Absolute fucking lunatic. And we wonder why he can't walk today. Um, I gave this a seven. Um, Garth, what did you give it, and why did you give it? I give it a seven. I mean, it's like Chris has the that bit in the middle, sort of uh, the six or seven minutes of them just walking around the outside bit. It was a bit pointless, but um, when they got in the ring and when they did that stuff off the ramp, it really sort of... The intensity was sort of... Dare I say it ramped up. Um, but that was... It was, um, so it I'm was, making football jokes and Garth is making the puns. What the fuck is going on tonight? <laughs> <laughs> it was a good match, so yeah, I went, I went seven. Uh, Chris? Um, yeah... Again, the biggest issue here is the brawl through the crowd. Like, crowd spots only really work when you're there live, and really, personally, I think they only ever work in, like, small arenas. Like, somewhere this big, it's not good because you lose track of them. Like, um, I'm trying to know, did anyone brawl in the crowd at TakeOver? No. Um, there's a reason for that, because the place was too big. <laughs> yeah. Um... And going seven as well. I'm really sad that six minutes had to happen, which is what Rob heard last night. Hey, uh... <laughs> um, what happened then was uh, we had another video package where uh, we saw the Dudleys breaking uh, Bueller's Bueller McGillicutty's neck with a 3D. Um, Pl- playing um, was a bad idea because that's the safest 3D I've ever seen. It was. Life. It needed to be. Um, and also, um, Tommy Dream is raw. Oh god, amazing! So full of it was amazing. <laughs> that was so good. <laughs> the promo's going up to this, and I remember this promo because they played it three fucking times on TV, right? And it was him. He like punched his um, he punched the locker into his hand was bleeding because he, he was so like, mad. He, he likes would. to do that, doesn't he? Anyway. Um, this match. Do you want to know the story? Um, I mean, I imagine the story is the Dudleys tried to kill Tommy Dreamer's wife. Tommy Dreamer wants revenge. I imagine. Well, well, first of all, Rob, we first of all have to understand what is a Dudley. And... <laughs> well, first we must ask ourselves, what makes a Dudley? A Dudley, um, a Dudley is for friends you made along the way. No, um. Um, the Dudleys are uh, a bunch of people because um, Big Daddy Dudley was a bit of the mantler. So, um, hence why you have so many different size and races in the Dudleys because they're all half brothers. Included in the Dudleys is Big Dick Dudley, Bubba Ray Dudley, Chubby Dudley, Dances with Dudley, Dudley Dudley, Devon Dudley, Sign Guy Dudley, Spike Dudley, and Snot Dudley. Associates include Axel Martin, <laughs> the Bushwhackers, 
Joe Gertner, Jenna Jameson, and Vampire Warrior. There's also a Dudley's outside of ECW, but quite frankly, I don't think they're canon. Um, apart from the back, see, but Dudley's because that's amazing. Um, anyway, so yeah, so the Dudley sort of that's sort of why Spike is on the other side because he's the runt of the family. He was sort of pushed out of it. Just to explain why Spike's there, Sandman's there because he has nothing better to do. Jesus Christ, he looked in He budget. really did, didn't he? Oh, well, well I, I really miss when he was getting waterboarded by Killer Cross. Um, so, yeah, um, this match, you're probably wondering why they, the Dudleys had their own referee um, that was assigned to this match on ECWT. So, basically, the reason that the, these other guys joined is because the Dudleys are the biggest heels in ECW. They've been, they've been running rough shot up and down the card for the last couple of years. So, like, this is like a big blow off to like, the Dudleys being dicks. Um, but Big Dick isn't here for some reason. Anyway, um, so there was a f- there was three matches on an episode of ECW TV. Um, there was Dreamer versus Bubba, Devon versus um, Sandman. No, Devon versus Spike and Sandman versus Big Dick. Not Big Dick. Yeah, Big Dick. Um, and yeah, the, the Dudleys won because Dreamer got ha, basically had a Johnny Gargano finish where he fucked himself. And yeah, that's how we got here. Also, um, <laughs> Joel Gertner. Wow, Joel right, Gertner. So let's, go on to, let's go on to the promo. So first of all, Bubble comes on saying he could beat anyone in WWF, WCW, ECW, and also anyone in attendance. Bubba Ray Dudley was known for inciting riots at the ECW arena. <laughs> <laughs> like, literally, like, he'd have to be snuck out because people wanted to legitimately hit him. Because it's for 90s, all you had to go was, you're gay. And someone's like, me? A homosexual? Never. Um, <laughs> how dare you? <laughs> how dare you call me? Someone who's, r- on, like, roughly, like, 5% of the population, I think it is. Um, anyway. Um, Bubba, Bubba said to some random cunt in the crowd, um, your man, I fucked your mother last night. Because um, <laughs> it's the 90s. <laughs> um, and uh, jo- oh my god. And then, like, they introduced their ref, which again is part of stipulation. He was holding a sex doll. We'll get to that. You mean um, Bueller so- McGillis Slotty? <laughs> that was actually quite yeah, good. Yeah, I quite like that. <laughs> so. Joel Gertness. First of all, before we go into his promo, what do you think of the presentation of Joel Gertness? Disgusting. <laughs> <laughs> I loved it. I thought it was fucking great. It was outlandish like, to a stupid degree, and I loved it. So, um, here's the thing <laughs> about wrestling. Um, it needs to, you, I think on some level, you need to instantly know who's face and who's heel. <laughs> yeah, there's no way Gertner was a face <laughs> at any point. Yeah. Uh, not one point in the whole bit when you look at Joe Gertner and think, he's a face. Like the neck brace, the baby oil, the, like he doesn't, the man doesn't look like he washes. But now, into the promo, because if you thought he was a fa- at all a face going into this, I don't know, maybe you're not good at reading anything. Um,. Okay, so the man your mother warned you about, I'm the only man that matters. It's so bad. It's so cringy. Um, Joe, I always leave them so, but they keep coming back for more. Go. Oh, God. <laughs> so wrong. There's a step doll called Pula McGillisletti, as we already mentioned. Um, Sangai has a ruptured rectum. Is that yeah. why he's got cast on his leg? And... Yeah, well, he got... He got... He got really injured. Oh, okay. Um, well, like when he said he had to watch his rattan, um, Joey Styles was like, "Oh, I bet, I bet Gertner did that." Yeah, Joey Styles is low key a really bad commentator. <laughs> what? Like low key he is because he do, he gets moves wrong and he tries to add color when it's not. It the didn't color help wrong. though that his color guy had fucked off. Yeah, mm-hmm. but he was trying to prov- he tried to provide color during when like when he had a color guy. Uh, yeah, that yeah, that is true. Actually, yeah, I did. Also, he kept breaking the fourth wall, which like I don't think com- like I'm fine when wrestlers break the fourth wall. I'm not fine when commentary breaks the fourth wall. It's kind of why um, Kevin Kelly gets on my tits. But anyway, the last thing from Joe Gertner, 
Um, bum, Bubba Ray Dudley is the man who dragged Beulah's head into the canvas with such impact that she didn't know whether to urinate, oh. defecate, or ejaculate. <laughs> so now, fun. I'm not being funny. The urinate and defecate, I kind of get that. But you, do people ejaculate on cue? Am I missing something? I mean, I've never met a woman like that. Garth? <laughs> not that I know of. <laughs> um, honestly, this promo went on for fucking years. Yeah, but but this sort of comes back to my point. I don't know. They were very clear. Like, expect, like Joel Gertner's was very much like about, about a big Joel Gertner promo. That's just what the Dudley's do. Like, I think so much of this was because especially the entrances of the faces, they took hours hmm. getting to the ring. And I literally think it's because they cut the match. But both guys were there. Why did they cut the match? What I don't understand... Well, what I don't understand is the face... I thought once we'd had, you know, all of the Dudleys and fucking Gertner, um, I was I was like, oh, all three faces coming out together. And then Sandman must have been... I don't know what he was trying to do, but he went all the way around the ring, up a ladder, down a ladder, into the crowd, out of the crowd, back up the ladder, across the ring, and then he, all the while drinking beer. Then he's pissing blood because obviously he smashed the can into his forehead repeatedly, as is his want. Um, but it must... I'm not joking. The promo and the face entrances must have been 25 minutes. It was. Um, it was roughly 27 minutes between bell, um, bell to bell between um, Bam Bam and um, Bam Bam Taz and this. I ended up um, fast forwarding quite a bit of it. Um, I hope you didn't fast forward um, our Lord and Saviour Joe Gertner's. <laughs> no, I watched that and then when that finished and they all just started kind of just standing around looking towards the ramp and stuff, I just thought... <laughs> <laughs> It did take the aid, um, did take absolutely ages. And again, it's because they cut a match for some reason. Um, I did like, but like, there was this nice little thing from Dreamer because it's like, must be like a concentration storyline thing because he didn't want to drink the beer Sandman gave him. So he took someone else's cup, put the beer in mm. it, and gave it him the cup. I like that. Whereas Sandman, you know, like, for example, when Stone Cold Steve Austin like chugs the beer, about 70% of it ends up on his torso. Yeah. Whereas when Sandman does it, because I'm pretty sure it must be ECW buying in the beer, he is not wasting a drop of that three beers. Again, again nah. he was developing at this point a rather hefty beer baby. He yeah, that was he, he was not like, in remember, good shape at all. I, I remember when he turned up in TNA last year, and I was like, oh, Sandman's looking rough. When I'm the same here, it's like, oh, Sandman's always looked rough. Like, because I think I just remember Sandman in like 2007 in his bed run when he was trying his bed best to, ha- to like keep his job, and then for some reason they put ECW legend Sandman on Raw. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not on ECW. I remember that. <laughs> Where he had a um, Singapore cane on a pole match against Carlito. I'm not joking. I distinctly oh, remember God, that. Oh God, that just sounds awful. It, it even like ten year old Chris wasn't into it. Um. But yeah, this I think the reason we're talking about like the entrances so much is because there's nothing to talk about in this match is really. Oh is no! Do you know what? I disagree. Um... Well, first thing, first things first. This blood feud, this blood feud where Tommy Dreamer has been inflicting harm on on himself because of how in, t- in how in distress he is over the condition of his wife, um, where he has tried to kill the Dudleys on several occasions to try and get back to him. Starts with a wrestling. Starts team. with chain wrestling. Yeah, <laughs> and, and that is my that is the worst thing for me in wrestling. Like, um, you think back to like Seth Rollins and Dean Ambrose at TLC, what twenty eighteen, and like I'm we're fine with you not chain. Like, it's literally the worst thing. Like, there's only a couple of instances where, like, like for example, Brett and Owen feud that makes sense because Brett didn't want to fight. Um, because A, Brett didn't want to fight Owen, and B, Owen wanted to prove he was as good as Brett. So, like, while well, it was a blood feud, they didn't have to, like, do that shit. Whereas here, this, why? The, the example I always remember 
is from TLC this year, and Bray Wyatt had literally been stalking the Miz's kids. Um, you know, proper being creepy, getting in his house, and you know all this, basically threatening his family. And Bray came out first, okay? And you know he did his happy thing, and you know we're really glad that you're, you know, that sort of thing. And he came out to the ring. The Miz came out next, and he did the spin and point. He did his entire shtick. And it was like, this man has threatened your family and your kids. He's been in your kid's bedroom, and you're doing the spin and point. He did the whole awesome. He got the headband on. He was like, yeah, awesome. And it's like, are you taking the piss? And I'm with you, Chris. That, That... it didn't wind me up in this so much, um, just because it was like Devon's chain wrestling. Um, it was more. I do. I do get it though. Um, genuinely, um, Garth, what did you think of this match? I thought it was. It was. It was another. One. It was. To be honest, I think it was the weakest on the card. Oh, overall, um, on that note, um, I'm, I have the case match article up right now. Every match is in cage matches, match guide, which basically means this is worth checking out, apart from the main event. There you go. Um, I just think it was just too much. It just it obviously started off as like a kind of six man, and then it just devolved into this clusterfuck of um, just let's hit each other with everything we can. And I get it; it's it's hardcore wrestling, but. Um, there was there was one part that I thought was really funny. I, I genuinely like laughed, like laughed out, and it was like the way Devon yes. was selling stuff. <laughs> I was hoping you'd mention that, <laughs> especially the neck breaker. There was a neck breaker, and there was a cent a swanton on or something on a ladder, and he'd hit his back <laughs> on it, and he sold it like he'd had his spine removed. It was great. <laughs> Uh, when they were outside and he got um, hit into like I think he got hit with a beer cup and then he got hit into the wall and the way he was just selling it was just brilliant and I, like genuinely just laughing just um, it's so over the top but it was brilliant um, I've, I've got written down here I've got Sandman disgusting and shite <laughs> like that's the only two things I think like how the fuck this man had a job as a wrestler like like it's weird because like he he can't wrestle. He can't cut a promo. He can't walk. He can't. I don't. I wouldn't trust him with heavy machinery. I like. I don't. I said okay. the tag team. So have you guys ever seen? Hey. Um... <laughs> <laughs> uh, have you guys ever seen Community? No. I tried to watch it. I couldn't get away with it. Anyway, um, there's this episode. Um, but community people people go. So there's this episode where Britta what needs to go back um, feels the need to go back to her ex boyfriend who's works in the carnival because um, and it transpires because he lost the part of his brain that makes him feel shame and that gave him a weird charisma. I feel that's what happened to Sam. <laughs> like Sam does have like a weird charisma. Like I wouldn't want to hang out with him, but like. It's weird. I feel like it'd, it'd be one of those night, nights where he gets you so drunk that you feel safe to take matches. You know the first time. what he reminds me of, and I don't know why? Ash from the Evil Dead. I've, I've never seen Evil Dead, so I can't go. Um, just the way he's like, I can, ima- I can totally imagine him turning to a woman and saying, give me some sugar, baby. <laughs> like, that type of thing. Like, let's go, baby. Like, and they're like, yeah, okay. <laughs> How has he not been pulled up for, like... Because that must have happened. Like, you look at him. Like, I'm not being funny, but like, a sexual harassment lawsuit happened to the Sandman. The main, like, argument for the defence would be, fucking look at him. Aww. <laughs> <laughs> but they also have a service match, the crowd were all looking the other way. I didn't notice yeah. that. I didn't notice that. Um, I, there must have been a fight uh, in the crowd. There must have been. I, I, just going back to Joey Styles and the Sandman, um, I tell you what, Sandman can't do, and that is pull off a Frankensteiner. And I tell you what, uh, Joey Styles can't do. He can't rename moves because Frankensander is the worst renaming of a move I've ever heard. It's better than when Frankensander. <laughs> <It's... laughs> have, have you ever heard Joey Styles try to say um, Polygon Nana? No. What? 
he, he does this weird Japanese accent. It's like, it's like he says like Horikon Rana. It's like the worst wow. thing I've ever heard about. Like people keep saying, telling me how good Joey Styles is. I've never watched a show with Joey Styles on commentary, but I've enjoyed the commentary. I think it's more because he's just into it a lot. I think that's more the thing. I mean, like I'm really into it. You don't, I don't get paid to do this. <laughs> um, it was, yeah, it was, uh, it was a my I enjoyed some of the spots. It was, it was chaos, and I quite enjoyed it's that. It's a house show main event. Yeah. I did it's note. I did. Um, I did note down that um, the spike was over. Oh, massive! Yeah, LSD, little spike Dudley. Nice. Yeah. Um, and he was. I mean, he was in WWE. He was massive. Like he was, he was getting massive. But no, he, he was getting the big pops when like the Dudley boys were like at the height, and he was like obviously doing this. I mean, to be fair to him, he, he was in there with some big motherfuckers who just kept like throwing him around. But he did that. Um, I like how he did the what's it called like the acid called, drop sliced bread acid drop. Yeah, acid drop yeah off the thing onto the chairs and things like that 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 was good and then he did the dive off the ladder that's the point where I thought yes the have they been hiding everybody when they've been doing the dives because at no point did you realise that they were standing there waiting for them to like, dive mm. on them um but the bit where he was thrown out to the table was a bit fucking harsh. <laughs> But I, I thought it, it was good. Like, it was a good finish. But I thought, I would have thought the Taz match would be better finishing the thing with the destruction think, on the ramp and everything. I think the point, well, the thing is, the easy, the easy to be crowd don't care about sport story more than they care about um, just things happening. So, this is yeah. perfect. Like, when it says the house show main event, it's like, it's still the reason why we have like tag matches or triple threat matches or whatever at the end of like house shows, because basically each guy can do one spot and that will be enough. So like mm-hmm. no one has to work hard about the same time. It looks like we are. What did you give this match, Garth? Six. I also gave it six. Chris, I didn't even give it a passing grade. I gave it four. I found it really dumb. Like I thought this finish came out of nowhere. Uh, no, I no, no, I can see I, that. To I think, be fair, I think part of it was because I had to sit through half an hour of Tommy Dreamer entering the ring. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, that that's fair. That's fair. Um, this is all then. Tommy Dreamer is celebrating his win, and you know, presumably the victory for his for his broken necked wife. When Jack Victory from Prior comes in, slaps him with a guitar shot, which brings out New Jack with the worst worst dubbed theme of the entire night because not only have they dubbed it in, they've dubbed it in in such a way that means you can't hear the crowd. Yeah. Um, So what was, I imagine, an astronomical pop got literally nothing because we got the music over the top of it and then it's just fucking weapon shots. There's a horrible... (laughs) Um, stop sign shots to Bubba Ray, uh, Bubba Ray from Bubba. Um, there's a massive guitar shot to Jack Victory. There's trolley to Devon um, Golf Club. Oh Jeez. God, the, yeah, just it was absolutely horrendous. Um, it's it's in fact it's New Jack, so we're just very lucky no one got that. That is true. Yeah. Um, but that was where the show ended. Um, overall, guys, I. Considering this was my first little foray into ECW, I thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, after yep. the 150th powerbomb, I was starting to think like, okay, we, we've done this now. Um, mm. But yeah, overall, really, really enjoyed it. I know that there was quite a few similar weapon shots, um, but there was enough there. There was enough story driving it. There, it was a good enough show. The matches were good enough that I wasn't really bothered by that. I think the two main events so to speak were the two weaker matches um but they weren't bad matches by any stretch of the imagination um i thought the mike Orson versus tanaka match was fucking great um i know it wasn't potentially a, a show steal but i really enjoyed the van damme sabu uh, hayabusa shinzaki match and i thought that lance storm versus candido was another great match um garth what did you think yeah same i mean up to the, I would say the, the Taz match. Every match just seemed to fly by, um, and it was 
like I keep I keep using the word fun matches. Like you wouldn't normally say that with a, like inverted commas like hardcore brand, but the matches were, had enough variety with them. And then those last two felt quite sort of stale. Mm. I don't know if that's. Um, I mean, there was like the the Taz match was still a good match, but it had the sort of the bit in the middle, and then the Dudley's match probably would have been good if it wasn't so chaotic. Um, but overall, I thought it was a really, really good show, like really entertaining and much better than I thought it was going to be. Um, Chris, I do. I loved the show when I first saw it because, like, I went through a mi- uh, like a mini ECW phase when I was like 16, 17 years old. I think it's like the first step a lot of people my age took before um, going to like actual alternatives to WWE. And like, I remember this blowing my mind at the time because I was used to like 2012 Raw. <laughs> so, like, you go from like 2012 Raw to, you know, this year, and I'm, it's like, holy shit. Um, in hindsight, it's not not quite as good as I remember, especially that tag match. I remember that tag match blowing my fucking mind, but like now, like I think now that I've seen a lot more like examples of how to do tag wrestling right, like all over the place, and just so like, yeah, it was fine. Like uh, this match, um, I don't think this is a show that's amazing when you first viewing, but like it doesn't hold up to rewatch too incredibly well. Um, and like remotely heavy scrutiny, most of ECW just fall apart. But that being said, when I'm like, when I was like in that ECW bubble, when I was watching all the weekly shows, you do get really, really into it. Like, what well, one thing Paul Heyman is good at for all his foibles, and he has a lot of fucking foibles, is he can hype up a cat like no one else. Yeah. And like, so when he's in charge of a show and can like, you can hype towards that big event, you're by the time you're there, you're like, oh, yes, I'm so ready for this. Like, again, I, this the build had me excited for the um, Jake Victory versus New Jack match. So, overall, guys, a good show. And well done, Chris. Um, a decent pay-per-view review. Um, I'm just trying to think now. Obviously, we'll do something else next time. But whose turn is it to actually choose a pay-per-view review next time? I've got a horrible, horrible, horrible feeling deep in the pit of my stomach that it might be Garth's, <laughs> and I've got a horrible, horrible, horrible fucking feeling he's going to make us do shit TNA. There is no chance. Well, I, I think after the big event and closing in career, <laughs> Rob, I'm voting for you. <laughs> Again. <laughs> Um, let's call it Garth then, who's doing our next retro pay per view. We'll let you know what he chooses when we uh, when we end up yeah. doing it. But in the meantime, guys, thank you so much for listening. Uh, you can of course subscribe to the podcast wherever you get your podcasts: Apple Podcasts, Google Play, wherever you get them. We are there. You can check out the website www.podmania.co.uk for archive podcasts of all the podcasts on our network, as well as reviews of retro pay per views, features, match rating archives. Everything is up there uh, you can talk to the podcast on twitter at at podmania join the facebook group at at podmania podcasts uh, you can talk to me on twitter at at real rob goodwin garth where can they find you at the garth <laughs> i forgot who's was that <laughs> the the makes that so much better <laughs> the garth berg um i like how <laughs> It's so crazy. Um, Chris, why, where can they find you, buddy? At Dave Meltzer, W-O-N. Oh, fucking hell. <laughs> and we'll talk to you guys again soon. You've been listening to the Podmania Pro Wrestling Podcast. Follow us on Twitter at Podmania, Facebook at Podmania Podcasts, and YouTube and Instagram at RealPodmania. And check out the website, podmania.co.uk. Until next time, wrestling fans. Podmania.